Well, we press on to maturity and discuss the rest of the story in Hebrews chapter 7, although we'll start at 6. But we need to compare the priesthoods of Aaron and Melchizedek because that's what Hebrews does. He wants to talk about these things because they are the things that are very useful for us to understand about how God is working to save us, how God has sacrificed to save us, what kind of agreement we have with him and how it is better than the law of Moses. One thing I noticed while I was preparing the sermon was that I had to capitalize the letter L everywhere. Uh, They have a real tendency to... uh, make it sound like you don't have to obey God. (laughs) As if it referred to just general law, as if God has no rules for us, uh, which is, of course, preposterous. It means the law of Moses. We're clearly talking about the law that came down from Mount Sinai. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 up through the third verse of chapter 7. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace, which is also the translation, translation of the word Salem. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. All right, what we mean by this when we speak of Melchizedek as we do in the seventh chapter is a method of interpretation. This is how we read the record. If you go back to Genesis and read what happened there, there are not many more verses than the ones that are quoted right here. If you look at what happened to uh, or what's recorded about Melchizedek, What's recorded is that he is the king of Salem and he is the priest of the most high God and that he gave, you know, there was bread and there was fruit of the vine and there was an offering and that Abraham gave him a tenth of the spoils after coming back from battle. So that's pretty much all there is. What the text here in Hebrews 6 is saying about that fact that is very sparse are these things. First of all, he's priest of the Most High God. It told us that. He blessed Abraham. And Abraham gave him a tenth. That sounds like he's ranking, doesn't it? And what we do with this is this. First, we translate that name. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. But the text also tells us that this man, king of righteousness, is literally the king of Salem. But Salem is also a Hebrew word, shalom. It means peace. So he is the king of righteousness by translation of his name. He is the king of peace by translation of his Kingdom, whatever that is, city, region. I don't know what Salem is. So first thing we do is we look at what does his name mean? It's not just like in English where our proper names don't usually mean anything. Uh, In Hebrew, their names are Hebrew words. They mean something. This fella is not descended from Abraham. He's being given a name in the text. A Hebrew name. There's no way that his name was, you know, Melchizedek. He was not a Hebrew. (laughs) That's what we're calling him in the Hebrew text. Why are we doing that? That's what this, that's what Hebrews is saying. Well, first of all, he's being called the king of righteousness, and we're told he's a king of a place called peace. 
So he is the king of peace and he is the king of righteousness. That's all that it means. He is without father or mother or genealogy. What we mean by this is there's no record of his father and mother. There's no genealogy rep, uh, presented for this king the way that the Israelite kings in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles always have a genealogy presented and you find out who their father and mother are. Not so for this Melchizedek king. This guy, we don't know who his father and mother are. We don't know what his genealogy is. It's not presented to us. Now, this doesn't mean that he literally doesn't have a father and mother and he literally has no genealogy. It doesn't mean that. And we know that it doesn't mean that. What Hebrews is saying is, this is how you read the Bible. There is no father and mother. There is no genealogy recorded here. And that is significant because typically father and mother and genealogy are recorded when you are presented with a king. That's all he's getting at. That's significant. The fact that he is without father or mother or genealogy, the fact that his lifespan is not given. Typically, they say he began to reign at this time and he ended at this time when he died. He lived for this long or reigned for this many years. Not so for Melchizedek. He doesn't get one of those either. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. He resembles the Son of God. That's why it's done this way. What Hebrews is telling us is that um, the features you would typically see when a king is presented in the Old Testament of his father and mother, his genealogy, his start date, his end date, you know, his lifespan, um, they're not presented. He is both a king and a priest. That's not allowed in the law of Moses. So this is different. Real different. But more than that, what he's saying is he resembles the son of God. Because, you know, in some sense, Jesus is without father and mother. I mean, he's God in the flesh. Yeah, people supposed that uh, Joseph was his father, but he wasn't. And people make too much of Miriam, his mother, although she was a good and a faithful woman who was a good example for us. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life is like the Son of God. He, doesn't, he was not created. He doesn't have a start. He doesn't have an end. What Hebrews is trying to get across is that these things are intentional. It's not there because it's intended not to be there so that he resembles the Son of God. So here's the argument that's going to be made if we get started on this idea. Hebrews 7, it's verses 4 and 7 and 11. This is the main idea. First thing is, verse 4, see how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. First of all, Melchizedek is ranking. In fact, he outranks Abraham. The seventh verse tells us it's beyond dispute. The inferior is blessed by the superior. So first thing is the man is ranking. Uh, he has somehow attained such a greatness <laughs> that Abraham on defeating five kings gives a tenth to that priest there, this Melchizedek. And Melchizedek blesses Abraham, not the other way around. Beyond dispute, the inferior is blessed by the superior, seventh verse. What we're saying is not only is Melchizedek ranking, but he's outranking Abraham. And in the 11th verse, if perfection had been attainable, which is to say completion, if the completion had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, under that law, or under the Levitical priesthood, the people received the law of Moses, who is himself a Levite, you know. What further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? So the third point in the argument, first is he's great, second is he's greater than Abraham. Third point is, well, why mention this foreign priesthood? 
Why bring this up? What's the point of, you know, what's the need for another priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of a priest named after the order of Aaron? How come we had to leave the order of Aaron in Psalm 110? That's the way that this is handled. This is how it is done. If you've wondered to yourself, what is it that um, Stephen was able to say? What is it that Apollos was able to say? How was it that the apostles in the book of the Acts were continually described as having confounded the Jews when they came to new cities and proclaimed Christ? This is how. This is how. You can show very easily, if you will, at least you can use what Hebrews has got down for you. You don't have to invent it. But I mean, you can read in this way. You can understand in this way. You can make application of the scriptures in this way. It's clear that Melchizedek was brought up in Psalm 110, way after Genesis and way after the establishment of the priesthood and the Judean throne of David. Why do that? (laughs) It's one of these passages in Scripture that demands an answer. There are several such that come up in the book of the Acts, and this is one of them. All right, so first thing, first argument, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, He's also greater than Levi. So when we speak about the fact that Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek, we look in the fourth, fifth, and sixth verses of Hebrews 7, which read, Those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their own brothers, even though these also are descended from Abraham. So the law commands that the Levites receive tithes from all the other tribes, even though they are brothers and they are all descended from Abraham. They're all one under Abraham, but the law commands it, and so it is. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and Abraham already had the promises of God. So how can he bless him? That's all we're getting at. There's something even bigger here. What is he doing? Who is this guy? In the one case we read in 8, 9, and 10, tithes are received by mortal men, the Levites, In the other case, tithes are received by one of whom it is testified that he lives. Because you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. It's according to the order of Melchizedek, because Melchizedek has no beginning of days, no end of life. And he's a priest and a king. So when the promise is made in Psalm 110, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, That is one who lives forever and serves as a priest and a king forever. In the one case, ties are received by mortal men. In the other case, by the one of whom it's testified that he lives. Which one is better, right? Which one is greater? One might even say Levi himself who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. One might even say this just to make the point, you know, if it wasn't clear, (laughs) Levi is descended from Abraham. The Levites, the priests are descended from Levi, who's descended from Abraham. And Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. That's how much Melchizedek's priesthood outranks Levitical priests. That's all he's saying here. People want to get crazy with how, you know, the fact that we were in Abraham's loins means we're guilty of Abraham's sin. That's just crazy. That's not what it's talking about at all. 
All he's saying is, if it isn't clear to you how the, how the, uh, the relationship here, this is the relationship. These are descendants of a man who's a descendant of a man who paid tithes to Melchizedek. <laughs> he way outranks them. So it begs the question, why Psalm 110? This is really the crux of the argument. And the wonderful thing about this being the crux of the argument is that, well, it's from God. God is the one who authored Psalm, 10, Psalm 110. God is the one who put that into the book. And everybody who respects God and who respects his word knows that Psalm 110 is there. And it does say this thing that's hard to explain. Why bring up Melchizedek centuries later? Well, we started this earlier and we'll finish it. The 11th to the 14th verses of Hebrews 7, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood under which the people received the law. Well, then what need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? Wouldn't we rather have had a priest come named after the order of Aaron? If the order of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, could have been the end-all be-all, could have been the completion, the perfection, then why wasn't it? Why would you then bring up another priesthood, a separate thing, Melchizedek's order? And the reason for asking this question and for forcing this question is this. When there's a change in the priesthood, there must also be a change in the law too. We are supporting, uh, in number 16, we're supporting God's choice of Aaron and Aaron's budding rod. We're not going down the path of Korah and his contradictions, trying to stand up priests from among the other children of Abraham, not just Levi. No, 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 no. That's clearly against the law of Moses. That's clearly sin. And God made it very clear to them that there's only one way to do that, and it's Aaron. This passage is not saying that Korah was right and we should revisit it. <laughs> He's saying there was no way inside of the law of Moses to have a different priesthood. If the priesthood is changing, and it must be because Psalm 110 is inspired by the Holy Spirit and it says there's a priesthood, the order of Melchizedek. Well, then it can't be the law of Moses that we're talking about. It must be another law. That's all this is saying. That's all it means. <laughs> the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. It's evident our Lord Jesus was descended from Judah. In connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Now it's true. The fact that Moses said nothing about it means that you can't do it. Silence is golden, or, um, well, I forget what else we use. They sometimes call this necessary inference. I don't think that that's right. We don't have to infer anything. We just have to do what he says. And what he says is make priests out of Levi. And when the others, Korah and his ilk, tried to do otherwise in number 16, God clarified that too. Well, I'm not necessarily down with the idea that this is necessary inference. It's just plain doing what God said to do. And that's what he said to do. But what we're getting at in Hebrews 7 is, well, this Jesus about whom Psalm 110 is written belongs to a different tribe, not Levi, Judah. And clearly Moses had no prescription for Judean priests. Then we go another step. And this is how we know that we are learning a method of reading. We're learning an interpretation, a way to use the scriptures. The right way, 
to use the scriptures. People are afraid of interpretation because they're not mature. But when you are mature and you know right from wrong and you know the world isn't full of gray areas and your head full of questions because you've matured in the Lord, you're not afraid of interpretation. The text is intended to be interpreted. And this is the method. It becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. So he hasn't become a priest just by being born to the right people, which is something that none of us had a choice about. (laughs) Being born to the right people or being born to the wrong people. And, you know, within our society, there are, there are you know, places and, and, and systems and whatever, uh, uh, social uh, ramifications to who you're born to. That's true. Uh, and yet, nearly everybody born in the United States is better off than most of the world. So, the, you know, we don't know. We're not in control of such matters. But this one became a priest not by being born to the right people. This one became a priest by the power of an indestructible life. Why is it indestructible? Because God said so in Psalm 110. It's witnessed of him, meaning God swore and God cannot be forsworn. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The fact that God swears you're a priest forever means you have an indestructible life. Jesus has an indestructible life. That's what we're getting at. No beginning of days, no end, or no beginning of days, no end of days. Well, we started in Hebrews six intentionally. Um, I started there because I wanted to make sure we grabbed what it said about the anchor of the soul, our sure and steadfast hope that enters the holy place, the holiest of holies behind the veil. This Christ who has gone as a forerunner and who has become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. It's picked up again in 718. On the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, because the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it's true, we have boldness to draw near to the throne of God because of Christ, who is our mediator, who is the sacrifice for our sins. And this one, who brings a better hope, a strength and a usefulness, is also made so with an oath. It was not without an oath. Those who formerly became priests were made priests without an oath. But this one was made a priest by means of an oath, by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Covenant is testament, uh, agreement, contract what that means an agreement but they became priests by means of their physical descent their birth this one has become a priest by means of God's oath and the power of his indestructible life he's the guarantor of a better covenant I mean, he, he is the one who is providing for us a better agreement than the law of Moses was That agreement was good, but incomplete. It could not save. It could not take away sins, right? We'll we'll get into these things later. But for now, let it be known that the priesthood of Christ in the Melchizedekian order is better than the priesthood of Aaron. First of all, he's a permanent priest. As we've just mentioned, he has an indestructible life. But chapter 7 of Hebrews, verses 23 
24 and 25 tell us the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. And there's that pesky death that keeps us from getting everything done. But this one holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Jesus isn't going to be passing the torch. There's not going to be another priest that comes along. Not like the Levitical priesthood, all of those priests died and had to be replaced by new priests. Not so in the name of Jesus. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Really, save forever is what it says. And I realize that the Calvinists jump right on it and say that this means that once saved is always saved. You're saved forever. But that's obviously violence to the text, which is saying he lives forever. <laughs> he continues forever. When we say he's able to save forever those who draw near to God, he doesn't mean that you are saved once and for all forever and nothing can be done. You don't have to obey God from now on. None of that's here. What it's saying is that he is forever able to save because he lives forever, unlike the Levitical priests who died after a period of time. He always lives to make intercession for them. The one who died, the one who gave his life, is the one who intercedes on our behalf as priest. The one who served in 33 AD is the one who is still serving right now. That's our priest. His offering is permanent. 27th verse continues. The other thing to note is that the offering he made is a permanent offering. He himself is permanent in his life, but the offering is permanent too in the 27th and 28th verses. He has no need, like the Levitical priests do, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. He has no need of that. He did this once for all when he offered up himself. That offering stands. He's risen from the dead and he's stayed that way. He now has this indestructible life. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices for his own sins. He doesn't have any sins. He offered a sacrifice for the sins of the people and it stands. The law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, Psalm 110, which came later than the law of Moses, yep, much later, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. See, the priest has to go in on Yom Kippur, right, the Day of Atonement, and make atonement for his own sins every year because he has sins. Jesus doesn't have to go back in and make another offering for sins because he doesn't have any. And he lives forever. So this condition doesn't change. It never changes. His offering, his sin offering for the people stands. It's an eternal Yom Kippur. The power of today is explored in Hebrews as well, and that's what we mean by it. This is an eternal day of atonement under Christ's priesthood. And finally, we will note that Jesus is the one about whom this is written as it started. In 726, it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. It was fitting that this is the kind of priest we should have. The Levitical priesthood was good, and the law of Moses is good, and what God gave us is right and holy and true. It's just not complete. It's not the end-all, be-all. It's not all the power. It isn't the fullness of the forgiveness that we now have in the Melchizedek priesthood of Christ. This Jesus is better than Melchizedek because he is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has ascended into heaven. He is at the right hand of the Father on high. This is the king and the priest. And Hebrews 8 verses 1 and 2 concludes this. 
matter about Melchizedek, saying, the point in what we're saying is this. Why talk about Melchizedek? Let me stop for a minute. Why talk about Melchizedek? (laughs) Why talk about Psalm 110, right? This is maturity. You've got to see why talk about it. Well, because it's very useful. It's very useful for understanding why did God do what he did in the law? How can we teach about the work that God is doing, about the saving that Christ is doing? This is why. But more than this, the greatness and the glory of God is evidenced. Hebrews 8, 1 to 2, the point in what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest. This is not fanciful. He exists. We have this. One seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. He's at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, the great power that is God Almighty. His right hand, his strength, his action, his fellowship, his approval is Christ, who is priest and king. We have a minister in the holy places. We said earlier in Hebrews 6 that he goes into the holiest of holies, a forerunner in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our minister in the holy places. The law of Moses has, you know, a high priest who can't go into the holiest of holies except for once a year and not without blood of sacrifice for his own sins. And even when he gets in there, all the stuff is inside the the Ark of the Covenant and even the mercy seat he can't look at because the wings of the cherub cover it. There's only one person who has a shot at seeing it in any given year and it's the high priest and he doesn't even see it. It's all covered. There's no access. But when Christ died on the cross and gave up his body for our sins, the the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The entrance to the holiest of holies was inaugurated in his blood. So we have a minister in the holy places. And it is the true tent the Lord set up, not man. The law of Moses does prescribe a tent. And they were allowed to build a temple later. It was not what God asked for, but they were allowed to do it. It is just a copy. It's just, you know, pretend. It's a metaphor for the real tent of God. The real place, the holy place of God. And... Jesus' service is not in the Levitical priesthood tent or tabernacle or uh, temple. Jesus' priesthood is in the heavenly places, the real tent that the Lord set up, not man. So that's the blessing that we have. That's the king that we have and the priest that we have. The priesthood, therefore, um, of Melchizedek is better than the priesthood of Aaron. And it is the fulfillment of God's promise to save us completely and wash away sins. Well, that's what God has done in this. And that's why he goes back to Melchizedek. And that's why he had the details of Melchizedek be recorded very sparsely. He knew he was going to write about this again in Psalm 110 and in Hebrews 7. So glory be to God for his word and for his power across the centuries, the millennia, uh, the people, the cultures, the nations and tongues. He gets his will done. His word accomplishes what he sent it for. But will you allow his word to implant itself in your heart is the real question. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus? Have you accepted God as the king? Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he's resurrected from the dead, that he serves as this great high priest and king? If you do, it's time to repent of your own ways and adopt God's ways and be buried together with Jesus, putting to death the old person of sin to be resurrected a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
We have water here prepared that you might be baptized in his name. We stand ready to pray with you and for you today if you are already a child of God but have been going astray. All of us need help from time to time. But our God is able to overcome. We can and must be saved in his name. It can be done. You can repent. You can make things right with God in prayer. We are glad to pray with you and for you to strengthen you and ourselves. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, take advantage of the time God has afforded us by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.